Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract. In this Zim Explorer, we're going to take a look at an e learning app to help us learn JavaScript terms and Zim terms. And it features the Zim Scrambler. So let's have a look. Here's the example right here. And what you do is you drag either of the sides and you're trying to make it so you're matching up the right term and definition. So that was a Zim pane. It's a good way to sort of give some quick instructions. And then we're into the app here. So the idea is we drag that. Oh, and I got it wrong. Oh, a class is actually that that was started off right. A class is a template to make an object. So there it is wrong. But if I drag this up to a template to make an object, we're good. And I did suggest that we start at the top. Uh, for instance, if class matches right now, as soon as I pick something up from here and move it up, oh look, class no longer is in the right order. So it's a bit it's a bit of a puzzle. <laughs> but if you do start at the top. Conditional, for instance, a conditional is an if statement. Yay, I got it right. Now I just leave that alone while I operate on these ones. What was that? It sounded like a strange telephone. I don't know. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Never heard it before in my life. Um, anyway, you can test to see how we're doing. Uh, the method is right, but the operator is wrong. That looks like an operator. We put it up there, but that's just uh, swap the method now. So as you can see, that one's wrong. We'd have to bring that back. Anyway, start at the top, work your way down. Start at the bottom, work your way up. That would be fine. I think that any playing around with this is probably helpful for learning. And then uh, we've got the mix here. We did mix this all at once, but it looked a bit messed up. So uh, usually a scrambler there's only one scrambler and it has a certain order and you're trying to solve it and once you solve it that certain order it says ah oh, yay it's solved okay so we've done that a lot this one's a little bit different in that there's no specific order we're just wanting to compare two different scramblers and there's no automatic way to do that so we'll have to code uh, that ourselves neat huh and when we're done when we get it all right uh, the test would show us a bunch of um, green green ones here and when we test it and it's all right, then we get an emitter will emit the JavaScript icon here uh, as a reward. Yay! There's also a Zim one that looks like this. And here are Zim things. For instance, uh, boop, 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 boop. these are the scaling modes. So if we started at the bottom, controls. What are controls? There are some controls right there. Zog. What does Zog do? It's a global function to log to the oops <laughs> to log to the console. Okay, and the same sort of deal where we're matching, and then it will emit the Zim emitter at that point. Okay, let's go in and take a look at the code. Here we are in Atom, and we're calling in Zim NFT with a crystal there. That means we can. Call in just one file, and it will then call create.js and zim in the background for us. We've also brought in our definitions. In the zim one right here, there's the zim one. Uh, the definitions, how we started was the definitions were right here in the file itself. Uh, but we then uploaded these to CodePen. So I'll show you a link to the CodePen versions in the, in the YouTube video description. Well, when we do that, CodePen shows the code right on the right hand side and you're sitting there looking at <laughs> the matches. So what we decided to do was move this out to a remote JavaScript file. So here's the remote JavaScript file. And you see it's just those variables uh, one and two, the arrays. Uh, they're in order. So the very first thing is statement. The next one, well, this is statement. The next one is expression, and this is the definition for expression. So the orders need to match here. If we wanted to, we could have put these all in one data structure, uh, like an array of arrays, and that would look like this. So we would put the answer right along with uh, 
the, the item there. Then we'd loop through and we'd make our stuff. We'd have to uh, go into the first element, second element. That would have been fine, but we didn't do that. We did it with a sort of a matching two arrays. So when we bring that in like that, it's stored in the asset directory when we, or assets directory, when we bring that in like that, uh, we, we won't be able to see the answers quite as easily. Uh, somebody can always go out and try and find that file, but at least uh, they're not sitting there right in front of them as they are trying the app. <laughs> All right, and that brings them in as global variables, which we then use inside of here. For instance, there we are looping through the one array right there. Anyway, we make a new frame. We're collecting the asset there. Uh, we're making a background rectangle. Let's have a look at this in Browser Plus. There it is in Browser Plus, and there's our JavaScript asset uh, right there. Oh, here's that gray rectangle. That's what I was going to show you. There's the gray rectangle in there, and then here are the things that we're dragging around. Here's the logo there. We uh, are now going to make a bunch of labels. So we went from strings. These things were strings in our data, but we're going to turn them into labels and indeed labels with a certain width and backing our background color. And that adds that background color for us. So here we are looping through the one array. That's the left hand side. Each time we get given what, what's in that array, which would be the string each time, and then an index number. Because we're going to use two different arrays, both one and two, we need the index number so that we can match up the two of them. So we're making a new label with the text of whatever's in A. We're setting the align of center on that. Uh, note these styles up here. These styles are going to be applied to our labels as we make them. Then we remove the styles so they don't get applied to anything else in the future. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else in the future that gets made that has any of those things. Maybe a background color. Yeah, these buttons. So uh, we turn the style off right there. However, uh, the align center, we don't want on both of them. As you can see, this label is aligned center, but this label is still aligned left. And we played with this a little bit. We could have uh, aligned right that and say, okay, do we like that better? I don't think I do. So I just looked at that and I didn't like it. I didn't quite like it aligned left either. I thought it just seemed more natural aligned center. So that's what we did. So this one's specific to this label. The other one doesn't even have an align. It means it will default to left. The other thing that's specific to, um, to these labels are their widths. So label width will specify the width of the label like that. It's not just width. And the one on the right has a bigger label width. And we hard coded these just depending on how, how big the information was. We didn't try and do any strange fitting or calculations or anything like that. The other thing that's different in each case is, of course, the string that's inside the label. So in the first case, it's just the item from the array. In the second case, we're going to the second array two and getting the item at that index. Uh, we could have just kept this consistent and said one there if we so desired. And if we used one array only with an array inside, then it would look something like A would have been that array, and it would have been A at zero, and then A at one, like that. Which looks quite tidy, doesn't it? Where this would be the uh, first text, and this would be the second text. Anyway, we didn't do that, so we're left with this at the moment. And what do we do with these labels? It's an interesting thing we've done. We've assigned them back to the arrays. So we're just replacing the string that was in one at, at i, at our index, with that new label. So now we have two arrays of labels, not two arrays of strings anymore. You could, in the future, we're, we're gonna have to match these up. We're gonna have to say at some point, does does this one right here match this one, which it doesn't. 
and we have to figure out some way to do that. One way to do, and you could do that later on, where we've got a comparison down below here. When we uh, test, we do a hit test, we're finding out if we're matching. So at this point, we could do uh, a bit of a calculation to find out if they're, if they have the same, um, if the in if the label at a certain index is equal to uh, the, the other label at the index kind of thing, then we're good. But that's hard to think about. And an easier way possibly is at this time, when we make these arrays, we, we know the matches. So what we can do is we can say, hey, the labels match. So this is the, the label at, at the left-hand side. Its match is the label at the right-hand side. And vice versa, because we don't know which one we're going to drop. Whichever one we drop, we, we know that label. But now we have to go figure out what's on the other side here. So um, yet if we drop this one, then we know this label. And we want to know the match of this label. <laughs> See what I mean? So we have to store the match either way. We don't know which one we're going to end up dropping. So if we drop the one on the left, then we'll ask for the match here and it will tell us the one on the right. If we drop the one on the right, it's going to tell us the one on the right's match is um, the one from the left. Okay. So uh, neat, huh? Uh, that happens quite often. You can always figure it out later, these types of matching things, but it's sometimes easier to just store a uh, custom property. That's a custom property. Oh, or is it? Yeah, it is. It might. It's also a JavaScript uh, function, isn't it? Match, an array function. Well, uh, this isn't on an array. It's on a label. So a label it doesn't have a match uh, method. Anyway, I, I think we're fine. You could have used some other name if you so desire. We're just concerned that that's a JavaScript command, actually, match. Um, pair, partner, <laughs> partner, howdy partner. <laughs> anyway, match uh, is what we used. All right, let's carry on. So we close the, the style. And now we're going to tile these arrays. It's pretty easy to tile an array, but there's a trick to it. Uh, when we pass in an array here to a tile, what Zim does is it automatically sees that array and picks one from it. it it's a Zim V value. I right? would normally pick from that array and just tile uh, a random one. And that's very handy. Often we pass in an array of things, uh, like a circle, triangle, rectangle, an array, and it would just pick one and randomly tile a bunch of those. Right? So that's a well-known Zim V pick dynamic parameter scenario. <laughs> However, if we want to actually tile each of the things in the array in order without randomly picking it, then we use true. Uh, watch, watch the big difference. If I took away the true there, this is on the left-hand side. Let's have a look at that left-hand side. Class, class. Now, do you see any operator, operator, operator? It's randomly picking from those labels and just uh, it can duplicate at that point. <laughs> So <laughs> that's messed up. <laughs> so this this parameter is not quite the last parameter, but is the last parameter we're using. Um, says do it uniquely. Uh, we had built tile to make art with primarily. We hadn't built tile to tile a bunch of interfaces or a bunch of things that we wanted uniquely tiled. Uh, there was only one tile parameter, so, <laughs> you know, we were just expecting to tile a rectangle and it would make a bunch of rectangles. We weren't expecting to tile, um, you know, a list of, uh, there's a slider, a dial, and um, then a label. Tile those, please. Uh, however, we found that tile was quite handy for doing that, so we had to implement this sort of a, a duo, dual way of handling tiles. Uh, one, the traditional way, where it just would um, tile that thing over and over and over again. And the other is where we could put an array in here. Eon. <laughs> put an array in here, and if we say true, that means treat this as, as unique. So there you go. All right. That means we could put in an array of 
various uh, components. And as long as we put true there, it would then tile those components in a unique manner. All right, so that's kind of tricky, isn't it? Oh, well. It's fine once you know it's there and that you can use it. Here's the, uh, the number of columns is one. The number of rows is the length of the array. And the uh, spacing in the horizontal, the spacing in the vertical. Okay, so if you wanted that to not be spaced in the vertical at all, you could do something like this. There's only a thin thread of spacing that is canvas art artifact. If you want to get rid of that, you could probably go like a negative one, I expect, and that would even a negative 0.5. And it's completely gone. Okay. However, we do want a spacing. Mod of zero, mod of six. There's the unique. And we're good to go. So those are our tiles. And a scrambler is really easy to make from a tile. The idea behind a scrambler is you pass in a tile, basically. And so we passed in a tile. The scrambler often works in two dimensions, where we're, uh, the most common use of a scrambler is for a, um, a puzzle. And we've just been doing some Zim puzzles. Do you want to see one? So we'll head to the Zim site here. I'm sure you've seen the scrambler before, but under examples, there's there's the one that we did when we introduced it in Zimcat. And that's what I mean by, oh, this is also a scrambler, uh, which is just a 2D one, uh, but this scrambler will know when it's done. This scrambler will know when it's done. What we've got are two scramblers that we're comparing to see if they, they match at any time and they're sort of random position here, random position there. So we're going to have to deal with that. Like I said, we've already shown you a little bit of that um, dealing by setting our match property. The other one, though, I wanted to show you is under NFTs, we've been making a bunch of these opart ones where we're, this is now on Hicketnunk. Hicketnunk here uh, is loading from inner, inner, interplanetary file system, which sometimes is a little bit slower than, certainly slower than, than Zim things. And we're selling these. So uh, we're making lots of money actually selling these, which is pretty nice. Collect for 60 Tez, what? When did this go up? So somebody bought this at a lower amount and are selling it for 60, that's 60 times five, it's $300 they're, they're selling this for. Okay, and this would know when it's done. When it's done, it, it animates a little bit and then it scrambles itself, like it scrambles and re-scrambles and keeps on going. Isn't that beautiful? Here is it full, oh, it's just, it's a lovely puzzle and you really get to sort of experience how the op art is made as you, as you work on this puzzle. It's neat, huh? It's there, 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 this one there. Corner. This one's down here somewhere. So yeah, it's, it's a trickier puzzle, isn't it? As you're trying to. Uh, it's down there. <laughs> We're pretty close, huh? You want to finish it? Where does that one go? It doesn't go there. Oh, where does this one go? Ah, that one's there. That's it. Almost there. You see how it's it, here? It is. We're almost there. Boop. Give you a bit of moment to see it, and then it does the scramble on it again. So there's a bunch of them on Hicketnunk. Here's my uh, the assets for that. So those are we we just did a game, but uh, we did a bunch of these. That we did some books. Those are built into Zims, and lots of other interactive NFTs that we've been selling. Made $2,000 in two months. Not bad. And so we're supporting. Here's the ones that we've collected. These are other people's NFTs that we're collecting. And I'm supporting the artists as well, which is nice. And who knows, if they go up in price, then we'll make lots of money. David Yang's circles. 
he was selling these on OpenSea for several thousand dollars. Anyway, this isn't on, <laughs> it's not what we're doing here. Let's get back to it, shall we? <laughs> so, uh, where were we looking right here? Okay, yeah, so we're passing the tiles into the scramblers and positioning those from the center, 280 over and 280, oh, it's a 280 from the left, 280 from the right, and let's refresh that now that we have our spacing back. There we go. And then we're centering them or vertically, zero vertically from the center. Great. What we've decided to do is when we press up on either of these, we're going to call the function test. So as soon as we let go, we're calling the function test. And here we are preparing to test to find out if whichever one we let go of, if it matches, <laughs> it does, wow, amazing, block of code, if it matches the one on the right. We're going to animate, note that we're animating the color each time. There's a good way that we can do it and a bad way, well, a good, a good we're gonna to animate to green. If it's bad, we animate it to red. So watch the animation. It just flashes a little bit. You can slow down the time of the animation. Let's try it to 0.4, and then you're really going to see it animate. Okay. Uh, we didn't feel we needed that much animation on it. So we, when it animates to green, it kind of goes a bit grayish. The purple goes to gray and then to green, and I think it looks better faster. So we sped that up. We're waiting, though, in the rewind state. So as it changes color, we wait for a bit before it rewinds. And there's the rewind true. That's how we can handle this. Yay. Um, problem is, if you don't call done, so let's comment out what's in done. There's what's in done. Watch what happens when you do a test. So I'm going to drag this down there and then hit test. Hmm. I refresh, refresh, drag this down here and then hit test. There we go. So what's happened is when I hit test, it animates all the colors and it rewinds to whatever color it was at when it started. Well, unfortunately, when I drag this down, it was red for a period of time. And when I hit test, it rewinds back to the red. So we were stuck with this thing that's red and it's always going to be red <laughs> so just to make sure there's ways around that the the sort of the proper way around it would be as you drag this and as it's animating there don't let people drag this again don't let people hit the test button so disable the test button disable the scramblers and we just thought, okay, right, you know, it's not that bad, but maybe what we can do is just call a function when we're done animating and make sure that at that time, the target color goes back to purple. And I think that handles it. So when we're done animating, make sure that the target's color is purple. And now when we save this and refresh here, if I drag this down and hit test, it works. So uh, maybe a little bit awkward because it, it jumps it to purple before that finishes animating or something like that. Anyway, I can't remember what it does, but uh, it, it solves the problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, back, taking a look at what we got going on here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we're using these two object literals to pass into animations. So here's the function that we're going to call on both A and B. A is the left-hand side, B is the right-hand side, I think. Or anyway, on both of these, it doesn't actually matter. We're going to animate um, this object, basically. And let me tell you about the copy in a sec. But we're animating using this object, if it's good but we're animating the background of the label. So don't animate the label's background color property. 
uh, we just animate because that doesn't animate we animate the background objects color and uh, why do we copy well when we animate um, when we animate animate puts objects into this object right here so if we use this object both here and here, this animation is going to put um, stuff into the object. And that object is also going to be used here and it can get mixed up. Usually we don't even assign an object to a variable and pass it into both of these things. Uh, I don't think you've ever seen it. Most likely you haven't. Usually we animate and we would expect to animate this stuff right inside like that. It, this is its own object literal that it has its own configuration object. Okay, right, agreed. That's usually what we would have in an animate and then we would just do it again inside of this one right here. But it just happens that we're animating exactly the same thing. So it looks a little bit wasteful to do it twice like this. But that's probably what you would have ended up doing is just like that. So what we've done is we've taken it out and um, abstracted it. So this is called abstraction. And said, we're going to put it in one place right here. However, like I said, when we paste, when we put it in here, when we send it in, Zim Animate will add extra things to it. So you you don't want to use the same object again later in here, because it will already have extra things in it, like the fact that it started <laughs> or not. You know, these things are put in there. I think it's other stuff like that. So, in other words, we're going to make a copy of this object right here. And Zim copy right there. It's available in the code section of Zim. It's just a little handy thing that allows you to copy an object literal so that it's not the same object literal. It's actually going to be a different. It's going to be a copy of this. And that way, this animate gets one copy and this animate gets a different one. Okay. So that obviously would make a little bit of a tricky bug for you if you didn't know what was going on with that. I've run across that on occasion, so I was I was expecting that. And like I said, most of the time you're just passing the configuration object right into the animate and you don't, don't do this. Right, so we've got good and bad set up for us and we've got our done. Now that will allow us to just say, hey, these two, please deal with it. They, they were good and they'll animate to green. Or if they're bad, we'll call bad and they'll animate to red, okay? All of this stuff, by the way, when we started coding, all of it was down here in this test. As a matter of fact, there's test left. It's longer than you think. It was all kind of inside here to be able to do it. And we did what's called refactoring. It's when we look at it and say, oh, yay, 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 that's kind of a lot of stuff. We're repeating some of it. Let's pull out the stuff we're re repeating. We'll move it uh, up to here. We'll rename this. We'll make some functions. It will make reading this a little bit easier. Okay. So um, that was us preparing just the animation part. Now, when we do the test, do you remember where we were? <laughs> We've got the scrambler dot on press up. We're calling test scrambler two. Scram one and two dot on press up. We're calling test. So, in other words, test doesn't really know which one we're which one we're doing yet. All right. We could have called two different functions: test one and test two, or test left and test right, because what we're doing is going to be a little bit different um, depending on which one we drop. Here's how, I'll just explain how we're going to tell if these things are related. When we drop one, um, I don't even know where, where this one is in the scrambler anymore. There's nothing, in, because you see as we pick that up, you see how it's up on top like that? Now it's just the top, <laughs> got it right, yeah. Now it's just the top thing in the scrambler. I have no... I don't know which number this was. Oh, let's see. I could have done it with a tile number. Actually, 
this item, this label has a tile num, and we could have just compared tile nums because the tile num never changes. The tile num always just is the very first tile or the first number, first index when the tile is made. Hey, that would probably have worked. Because these were tiles originally, they'd each have a tile num. All I'd have to do is see, does this tile num match that tile num? Well, okay, that's fine. But how do I know? Oh yeah, how do I know what the current tile number is? That's the problem. Because I need to know the current tile number here so I can look over here and get the tile at that current tile number over here. And there's no real easy way to do that. Um, because we don't keep, we, this is usually rows and columns. I don't think we keep the current row as we drop this. I don't think the scrambler knows what row it's on. Uh, the way you would want to find that out is like if you're building this, you would look at the scrambler and see what properties it has. Does it have, uh, well, let's, let's go do that. Let's have a look at the docs. Because I could look into it a bit more. Scram. <laughs> Scram. So here's the Scrambler docs. Uh, there's methods. Scrambler solve test. Returns true if the tiles match. No, that's not doing it. Test item. Because remember, a Scrambler is supposed to work on its own. Here's the properties. Type, complete, starts, and order. An array of the current index order. Let's see, this will be scr the scrambled order, example three, blah, blah, blah. So um, this, won't this will tell us the order in which they're scrambled. I wonder if the order, the array of the current index order. I wonder if this is the bottom, the bottom element is three, the next one up is two, the next one up is zero, and therefore the last one in this list would be the top one that we just dropped. It's a possibility. In which case the last thing in this list would be the original tile order. But it doesn't tell us. Oh yeah, what we could do then is see if the last... Yeah, that's not going to work because on the right hand side, the, the object that it matches may not have ever been picked up. So it's not, these aren't going to have the same order as the left and the right ones will not have the same order. So anyway, there is no real way that we could find out which number we're on and ask, well, what's at the same number on the right hand side? However, there is a nice, easy solution. <laughs> so, as I was thinking about it, there wasn't an easy solution, but there, uh, with using the scramblers, but there is actually a kind of, well, I hesitate to call it a fudge solution, but uh, what would you do? Any, any thoughts? Here's our test. There it is right there. What we do is if we're dropping the left-hand side, we take whatever we've dropped and we move it over 300 pixels. That takes it and moves it over to here. And then we do a hit test to find out which object it's hitting. So we have to, at that point, we have to loop through each of these and find out if it's hitting. So we're going to loop through the second tile and each time we get B, we've, we've called this A. So A is the one we've just dropped over here. And then we loop through the other side here. There, is, there we are looping through the second tile. Don't worry about the wrong just yet. We kind of added that after to find out something. I'll tell you that in a bit. Looping through the second one, each time we get whichever item is there. And we find out if the item is hitting the registration point of what's been moved over. If it is hitting, that means we found the matching item on this side. And now it's easy with our match thing. So if a dot match, so if what we stored in the match is equal to 
B, the item that's on the right hand side, then we call the good animation and pass it A and B. Else, we're going to call the bad animation and match A and B. So the thing that it's hitting, if it, if it matches, this could have also been does A mat equal, double equal B dot match. Either, either way would have been fine. Does A double and B dot match. Like that. Um, so that's that's what we did, and then we move it back. So there, there's us moving it back. It'll do the hit test just fine, even though we don't see it move at all. I want to see what it looks like if we don't see it move. I think the scrambler ends up putting it back in place, though, so it's sort of a bit awkward. I can't remember for sure, though. There it is. So we haven't done anything on that side, but you can see that when we do this, there, there it is moved over right there. Looks like we moved it over a little bit too far. Although the registration point's kind of like right there, so we just caught the registration point. <laughs> we, we, we just moved it over some amount. Let's see what moving it over 200 looks like. Yeah. Probably the same, more like about 250 would be in good registration point territory. Yeah. Registration point center regged, because uh, we made sure to do that up here. Label tile, not the tile. There's the label center reg right there. So both of the labels that, that, that we make are center regged. Here's our match stuff. How exciting! Ooh, where was that moving it back? So there's the moving it back. Um, we do want when we when we do this test. So when we do the test. Uh, right now, <laughs> oopsies, I think I moved it back. Oh, yeah, too much. Okay, so that's 250 now. 250, there we go. Okay, and good, it's working just fine. So there it is, moved back. That only tests these two things. When we drop, we find out what we dropped, and we do the test. Initially, that was all uh, done right in when we dropped it kind of thing right into this test here oh by the way we've added a timeout to the test the test is what's being called when we drop the thing right here so there's us dropping our press up it's calling test we use the e dot uh, current target to find out which side this belonged to so e dot target is this um, label right here or if we're on this side, e dot target would be that label right there, but e dot current target is what the event was put on. E dot current target. Where's my events? There they are. So we're calling test. E dot current target is going to be scrambler one if the item came from scrambler one. E dot current target is going to be scrambler two if the item came from scrambler two. So that's a nice easy way to find out. Are we working with the left-hand side, or are we working with the right-hand side? Is to find out uh, what the dot target is. So if we're working on the left-hand side, we're setting A to E dot target, and we're testing the left-hand side. That moves it over to the right. It starts off with a one and knows where two is, and you know that kind of stuff. Otherwise, if we're on the right-hand side, we set A to equal E dot target. Actually, I guess. We could just, we're doing the same thing in both cases. We could just pull that out. I'm not bothered doing it in here. In which case, we got a single line and we're dealing with uh, something that looks like this. Looks nicer. We could also, oh no, that is probably the easiest. I was going to say we could use a, a ternary operator and just test that and send the right thing in, but we're sending the same thing in. It's a different function that we're running, so may as well just do it this way. Okay, so that's good. I should go into the code pen and reduce that. I'll try and remember afterwards as well. As well. 
I'll just do a quick check here and make sure my logic is good. Yeah, seems fine. All right, so test left and test right. We're passing in A to those. We did the hit test, we did the looping. Oh yeah, uh, what I was going to say is when we do the drop on either of these sides, it does that one test. But then we realized, oh my goodness, um, when we want to test all of them here, we basically are going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to move each one over and test it. And so hitting test um, loops through and tests all of them. But we really only have to test one side. So we're, we're just looping through the left-hand side and doing a test. When I do that loop through there, great, some go green, some go red. But I want to know if they all go green, then I want to give them the reward. So afterwards, you see the right-hand side here. It looks like this. It's basically the same. But if you take a look at, at this, it doesn't have this wrong variable in it. So only the left-hand side is being run on all of them. And only the left-hand side needs to know if any of these are wrong. So here's how we treat that, I guess. We say, we assume there's zero wrong to start. And as I loop through each one and, and get a hit test, um, if it's not matching, so if whatever it's hitting isn't a match, then I set wrong to one. And what I'm doing in this test function is returning what wrong is. So if I'm going to call this test left, I'm going to call it 20 times or however many we have there. It's going to call it a bunch of times. And each time it's going to return whether it's right or wrong. If it's if it's right, it's going to wrong's going to be 0. But if it is wrong, then wrong's going to be 1. Okay. Here's the button down here that does the test right here. So this is the new test button. We put it at the bottom right hand corner, right bottom corner. And when we tap on it, we are assuming that wrong is zero. We're looping through the one tile. So that's the left hand tile. Each time we get the uh, label in that tile. And then we're going to test that label. So we're, each time we get an object, which is the label, we're going to test it. Uh, what are we passing in one for? Testing on the left hand side the object and one. What does that do? I don't think that does anything. Testing on the left hand side. Yeah, okay. That, I was putting something in there, but we never ended up using it. Okay. So we're um, testing on the left hand side. And you see how we're increasing the score of wrong? Wrong started at zero. And we're going to find out when we call each one. If it returns zero, we're going to add zero to zero. But if it returns one because it's wrong, then wrong will be one more than it was before. Basically, after we run that loop, we say, hey, if wrong is zero, that means we didn't get any wrong. We start off at zero. Each time we got something wrong, we would increase wrong. But if we didn't increase wrong, then wrong is going to be zero. and we're going to win. We're going to spurt that emitter. So watch this. If we say if wrong's not equal to zero, that's the reverse. Can you figure out what's going to happen now? <laughs> Oops. Uh, <laughs> I was supposed to spurt. <laughs> uh, let's see. How did that work out? Um, Oh, I didn't test, right. Yeah, so it doesn't spurt. It doesn't know if this is at the end because otherwise what we'd have to do is every time we drop this, we'd have to loop through all of them and test all of them to see if we won. And that means that we'd have to have two different systems because I, I didn't want this to happen every, like I didn't want all of them to say green or red every time we drop one of these things. Anyway, there's our test. So this is only running when we press the button test. We press the button test. It's wrong, but 
there it is um, spurting. So that's supposed to be zero wrong. We refresh here. I hit test. It doesn't say of one. Got it. If I say it's not equal to wrong, the emitter is going to spurt. Uh, but this allows us to test the emitter. So that was the first thing I did to test to see if the emitter was working was um, just flip this so that I don't have to <laughs> I don't have to finish it every time I go and test the emitter. The easiest way is just flip this temporarily. We refresh here. And now when, well, if I hit test, it's wrong. And I can test the emitter. Yay. Um, what we did is we put a timeout in there as well. When we originally ran the emitter, it was... It was like going over top of showing me all the green. So what we want to do is we want to see all of it green and then um, do the spurt of the emitter. Okay. Nice, huh? Test. Give us a chance to see that we got them all right and then spurt the emitter. So a little timeout in there to call that arrow function. That's why we pause the emitter to start. I can't remember if I showed you. We should talk a little bit about the emitter. How are we doing for time? We're 46 minutes. Yeah, we have enough time to talk about the, the emitter. We're almost, we're almost done there. But before we do that, let's just finish this off. Uh, the other stuff off here. So that was up here in this test. That's what the wrong was doing. This function figures out if when you pass in it A, it's going to go over to the right-hand side it's going to do a hit test on this side, find out if it's the right one, if it matches. Um, if it doesn't match, it's going to increase the wrong. And it's going to return the wrong. Therefore, down below, when we loop through the tile and call the test left, it's returning wrong. If it returns one, it's going to increase the number. And that would mean that uh, that's the right way to do it. We increase the number because we're wrong. That means wrong's not. It's none of this is going to run until finally there's none wrong, and then this is going to run. Um, maybe some advice there. Sometimes it's easier doing the positive. Uh, I for some reason thought I would just find out a wrong one, but you could have used right, and then it's positive value. It might have been easier for you. Who knows? Okay. So, uh, did we finish what was going on up here? So these are, that's our test left. I think we went over the test. Test right is basically the same, except with the test right, we're dropping one of this side and we want to move what we've dropped. See, we don't know the left-hand side. So at this point, all we know is we've dropped this one. We have no idea what's on the right-hand side, so, or on the left-hand side, so we can't drop it. We only know what's on the right-hand side here. So we have to move what's on the right-hand side over to the left. We loop through the left tile. Here we loop through the right tile. So we loop through the left tile and we're doing basically the same thing. Are these two things hitting? And if they are... Oh, that's the hard way to do it. I didn't change it. Okay. Uh, oopsie, we'll have to go and change that. So this is basically the same thing in here, I think. So that was the hard-coded way. So what I did is I, I tried to figure out how to do it by finding out what index this selection is. So whatever the index is, that gives me the original uh, location in the array and then we're getting the object at that original location and finding it out if it's equal to the one that we've got on the right. And see that was a little bit tricky to figure out how to do that. It's not the end of the world but it's a little tricky. All right I found and then what I did is realized okay we can just do a match which is much easier. So this works for this one as well. Because these both work with a match on the A I think we could do it We've got the A, and I think we could just do it. Oh, but A is the right-hand side. So in this case, if we only put the match on the first array, then we would have to say B, because that's the left-hand side, is equal to A. Alrighty, let's try it. 
And we move here. It's not matching a template to make an object. Mm, that's a class. It's right. Okay, and let's do it the other way. A class. Yeah, so that works. And B dot match, B is actually the left hand side because A, when we're testing the right hand side, A is the right hand object and B is the left hand. So there we are using the match on the left hand side if it's equal to the right hand side. Here, we're using a match on the left hand side because A is now the left hand side. Uh, right there, we're testing left and passing in the left hand side and is matching the right hand side. So what that means is up above here, do you see what's going to happen? It means we only have to put the match on the left-hand side, like that. We don't need a match on both sides. As I was explaining to you in earlier on when I mentioned these, because we either have the left or the right, I was thinking, oh, wait a minute, we could have done it <laughs> just, on, just on the one side always is matching the thing on the right. And so let's have a look, see if it still works. So a statement is a line of code that ends with a semicolon. Okay, and that just turned green. There it is, just turning red. So it works for good and bad. That's bad. Move it to here. That's good. See, all still working, storing only one match property on the first one. Yay, so I'll have to remember to fix that up in the code pen along with whatever else we were fixing in the code pen. I think it's one or two things now. Um, okay, good. So that's us doing basically the same thing. And then we have to, uh, we had moved this one over to the left and now we have to move it back over to the right. So there it is. Where is that going? Let's have a look and see when we move it. So if I go like that, yeah. So now we're checking to see if the registration point of A, which is the right hand side so is the uh oh is a hitting the registration of b so yeah so is this whole big thing hitting the registration so uh, that's, uh, that's fine oh uh one thing i didn't mention is we had to put in a timeout on this put that back we have to we had to put a timeout on this because take a close look as we're dropping this like that say i drop it there it um, it may be, uh, now that it's centered line, it might be, I think there's enough room that the center of this might, as I move this over, the registration point might be in the crack, in which case it doesn't know which one it's hitting. Uh, so we really wanted an event that says when this is finished animating. I believe there is an event called scrambled or something like that. Let's have a look. So here's the scrambler. Uh, it's not the scrambled, scram go. Here's the scrambler. Dispatches a complete event, dispatches a scrambled event when the tile is finished scrambling. Now that's when we scramble it and it's done scrambling. I don't think there's an event that happens once we drop the object and it animates to the right place, it looks like there's not a custom event here. A complete event when the tile changes, no. So we did a press, a press up. We were using for our event a press up here, right there. But there's going to be a little bit of time until it animates into the, the final position. Now you can specify that time in the scrambler right here. I believe. Um, and there's a default time that we could use. And therefore, what we could do is just wait. So here's the test function that that's running. We're waiting 0.2 seconds. We should really wait however long that default time is. Let's see if I'm making things up. Is there a default time? So here are the parameters. Key property time. If scramble is set, no, that's not it. Wait, if scramble is set, no, that's not it. Shadow color swap. Set to true to not swap, swap block style. No, I don't see a time set there, which means most likely it's uh, you're stuck with it. There's a certain time that we, we take to animate the tile to the, the right position. 
I could have sworn there was a snap or something like that, at least. That, you know, we could have just immediately gone there. Be in, in these parameters, tile, keys, key property. Scramble, time. Now, those aren't the ones. Swap. Set to true to not automatically shift tiles and swap the drag tile with the tile that is dropped that is dropped on. Swap lock. Set true to lock tiles that are in the right spot. We'll set the swap to true. I didn't realize there was a swap lock. I forgot about that. Anyway, um, blah bitty blah bitty blah, in which case the answer would be to take a look at the code here, view the scrambler itself, do a control F4, animate, enter current stop animate, there's nine occurrences here, animate, 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 animate. there's an animate, ah, 0.2 seconds, what do you know? So. It's hard coded. There was no parameter to say how long to animate that to. Probably could have been a parameter. <laughs> anyway, there it is. 0 0.2 seconds. <laughs> and uh, we chose 0 0.2 seconds. So we're waiting 0 0.2 seconds until it finishes animating. And then we're testing to see. Yay! Good. Uh, all right, let's finish off with that scrambler then we've got a button to mix down here well we can see how that works so here's the mix when we tap on it we're telling scramble one to scramble this is take one second to scramble don't wait any time before you start the scrambling and uh, scramble twice this is take one second to scramble wait one second before you start scrambling and scramble twice. The reason why there's a wait is often you get something right, like when it's complete, the complete event, you want to say, yeah, it's complete, let's scramble it. But you want to let them look at the puzzle or whatever is complete, you want them to see that for a bit. So you could put three seconds in here, for instance. And therefore, once it's complete, you get to see it for three seconds. At that time, Scramble has built in that it will not allow you to scramble the puzzle while it's waiting. So while this one second is going here, I won't be able to scramble the right-hand side puzzle. Um, anyway, so you might wait three seconds and then scramble. So that's why that's in there. All right. We could have also scrambled these at the beginning. Note that when we do this, these aren't scrambled, like they are scrambled, but we don't see them animated. Uh, probably what would be better, I think it would look clumsy to scramble them while this is on top of them. Maybe to click like this and have them then scramble. It's fun to see them scramble. So that would be on the close event of the pane. So we made the pane down here. We would store the pane in a variable and say pane.onClose. Do, basically do what we did here. Let's see if we would like that, huh? Let's see. So that would be const pane is equal to that and pane.on close comma arrow function and in here we would scramble them. Refresh. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it just gets gets in the way a little bit. They're already scrambled. I don't think, uh, so my my thinking was right as far as I don't think we would want that. <laughs> Didn't put it in. Let's just get to it. However, when we've all matched them, obviously we want to offer a remix of that. So that's that's that. Alrighty, and we were just talking about or wanting to get to the emitter here. So the other button test is going to loop through, run all those things to match each one, find out if any of them are wrong, and if they're wrong we emit 
the emitter. So I may as well put that back to a not equal to, and that would uh, show the emitter when we hit test. Okay, there's what we're doing there. And what that's doing is calling the emitter, which is right here. So the emitter is start pause true, otherwise starts at the beginning. We're emitting the logo. We slowed it down a bit. The default emitter is, is faster than this. It's 0 0.01, like it's a lot of things, but uh, they're big and clumsy looking. And so a lot of them just was just too big. So we, we slowed it down a bit there. We also made them last a bit longer so that we see them fall most of the screen before they start shrinking. If we didn't do that, we would get something that looks like this. So emitters are really easy. You could have just emitted that. Like watch, just comment all this stuff out. That would have looked good. Ready, refresh here. Okay. There's what the default emitter would look like. It's like, wow, yay. Okay, but it goes in all directions. And as you can see, it doesn't last quite as long. It's sort of, that looks okay too. So it's up to you whether you want to learn how to use the emitter. Um, emitting just default, heck, just a default emitter would probably be good too. That looks like this. <laughs> yeah. Yay, we got some little balls. <laughs> okay, uh, but you can emit anything, so that's that. Um, the interval that we're going, we slowed it down a bit. Here's what uh, that looks like. So it's a little bit slower than our original. We made them last longer. So here they are lasting longer. Good. Um, they all are being emitted at the same force. So that means they kind of, um, I don't know. It's not that bad when, it's not that bad when they're all going in different directions, you don't quite notice, but when we set the angle so that they're going in here, so the angle is zero, is this, that's zero. Right now the default is angled anyway, but if we set the angle of zero, for instance, that would look like this. And that's because we've got gravity. If we don't have any gravity, gravity. I, I don't mind having gravity, but here's gravity of zero. Then it would look like this. <laughs> Looks kind of cool. You can make laser beams and stuff like that. Um, but what we've done with the angle is we've made it we've made it have a minimum of minus 30. So that if that's zero, minus 30 is 30 degrees this way. So it's gonna shoot up a little bit to 45, shooting down a little bit. So it's sort of shooting in a cone somewhat like that. And we're using gravity to let it sort of fall over the stuff here. And here's what that looks like. So there they all are at the same force that's at the default force which I believe is five and because they've got a different angle they look a little bit different as they're falling but if we randomize the force so this is passing in a zim v value to randomize the force this was passing in a zim v value to pick from that range okay refresh here Now they're a little different. Some fly out here, some go, some just drop down because we've applied mins and max of the force there. And we tried a few different ones and decided that that was the range that we want. Just takes a moment. And then we also want to animate it and we're animating its rotation. So the pro when you pass in an animation object, this is an animation object. It's a little bit different than animate, but it's the same thing. You're passing in an animate object. If you pass in the Zim Duo animate object to um, animate, here, this is what it would look like. You would specify the props. So here are the props that we want in rotation. Uh, that, by the way, is a default of one second. So you'll see them spin, and maybe because the life is two, we might actually want to pass in two. That would be maybe another. So that would 
across its life rotated this rotation. I did notice that as it was rotating, some of them stopped rotating after it looked a little awkward. Okay, so the rotation, um, Zim animate also accepts uh, the Zim V value of a range there if we want. It would also accept this rotation 10, 100. So what that would do, it would animate these objects randomly 10 or 100. I thought, did we lose one of these brackets or something like that? I don't see any problem, but maybe there's a problem somewhere. Squiggly bracket on 128. One squiggly, two squigglies. One squiggly. It's going to here. Two squigglies is going to there. Save, refresh. Weird. I don't see a squiggly problem. <laughs> One, two. Oh, I mean, we've got. These are the props. This is the animation object. That's on the emitter. Here you go, commas. Oh, um, right, crap, uh, time. Okay, so props, colon, here are the props, time, colon, two seconds. Refresh. Mm. So what you just saw there is those are animating over two seconds. They're either animating to 10 or they're animating to 100. Let's change it to one second. I saw some that looked quite tilted. Those were the ones that were at 100 and the ones that weren't quite as tilted are the ones at, at 10. So we, we want a range though. And there's the range object, and that has to go time, cool. two seconds. So we're going to negative 720, that's twice around, uh, positive 20. And this is a range, so it's going to rotate anywhere in there. And here's what it looks like. Yay! And that was the, the way that we did it, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Uh, it took a little bit longer. I, almost, you know, I wonder if I like it better rotating it faster. I think I do. I think it gives a little bit of a whoosh at the beginning. And so so if it... Either that... I, I like the more rotation. Either that or we could go two seconds here and then double this. Whatever that is. At which point it would be something like 4 times 360 is how you would probably write that so that you can just adjust that and realize what you're doing here. And this would be 4 times 360. Or minus, oh, this one's positive 360, the other one's minus 4. Okay, so um, we made it rotate farther, because the other before it was 2 times, and we've kept the, the longer 2. So this means it will spin throughout its duration. Yeah, I guess that's good. You know what, though? Because of the easing, the easing is starting it off. It's going over two seconds now. It's starting off slower on rotation. I uh, almost want it to not have an ease in. Ease, colon, quote, uh, quote, quad out so only add the easing on the out that means it'll start spinning really fast and slow down refresh yeah what do you think a bit more of a reward there rather than have it ease into the rotation and start rotating it uh, you know around here and then ease out so that's what we were seeing better. Like when the time was one, it got to rotating in around here. When we set the time to two, it was like really spinning around, like down farther. 
So by adjusting the ease and the, uh, so the, here's what it looks like with the ease adjusted and one second. <laughs> then it starts looking awkward because uh, some are spinning a lot, a lot. And other ones aren't spinning as much. How would you deal with that? Um, you could, believe it or not, you could do something like this. You could put square brackets in here. Oh, we're running out of time. You put square brackets in here and pass in two ranges. A positive range and a negative range. So this would be something like two. So here's a positive range. Two to 360, so that would be twice round to four times as round, comma. And this one would be on the negative side, minus two to minus four, like that. You know what? The min to max range may actually have a negative parameter, which means you can just set a positive range from a min of you can set this positive range right here. Anyway, before we leave this one, this would work because what happens is the rotation would pick one of these two and pick is recursive. So then it would pick, if it picked this one, it would pick from that range. If it picks this one, then it would pick from that range. So this would work too. It would give us faster rotations because there would be no, ro like it would be give us more consistent rotations where we wouldn't have some that are rotating at, you know, 10 degrees total. And we'll do this in a time of two. Let's see what happens. So now they're all rotating. I don't like it as much though. I think it just seems overly rotated. And they are going one way or the other. But maybe if we drop this to one times, then that would have some that are going slower, but still not some that are going too slow. Yeah, that looks nice. So I found that sometimes there are some that are like sitting at zero rotations. Now let's just check on the, this is the range object to see if the range object has a pr property that is called um, negative, I think, negative true. I can't remember, let's have a look. We do that in the RAND call. And I'm glad you're still with us. If you're still with us, oh my goodness, it's been a bit of a long one, isn't it? We're sitting at a minute or a minute 12, <laughs> an hour and 12. Usually we like to wrap these up inside of an hour. So if you had to watch it for a bit and then come back later, hey, that's okay too. If you never got to this part, oh well, you wouldn't have heard this. Well, let's go take a look at our docs on. Uh, go away. Uh, where, this isn't my docs. That's not the docs. This is the docs. Docs have a top thing here. <clears throat> so if we look up rand like that, this is rand integer and negative. What negative does on rand is includes the negative range as well as the positive range. So if you give a positive range of say 10 to 20, setting negative to true will also will do 10 to 20 or negative 10 to negative 20 because that's tricky otherwise to do that. Um, so we put in a parameter that handles that trickiness for us. However, this is the RAND method. What we're looking for really is a, um, a, a zim pick, uh, which is so is pick and next pick choices. So here are the formats right here for zim v, which is the zim pick. Um, you can pass in an array, you can pass in a range. Ah, uh, range object format, do you see the negative? I don't. Uh, we saw the combination. It might do it anyway. Let's just see what happens if we try it. Maybe we've just forgot to document it. I would imagine that this would just get passed right into a random in some way. So to test it, we would say comma negative true there. Get rid of the negative version and then see if these things rotate both ways rather than just positive. So we refresh here. 
Hmm. Yeah, they do. They're rotating in a negative way as well. Uh, the way we can test that is take off the negative and see if it only rotates to the right. Yeah, now they're only rotating clockwise. Which looks okay too. So let that be a lesson. <laughs> Sorry, our, our docs are really good, but I mean, there's a lot in the docs. And so we, looks like we didn't put that in there as an example. It's kind of like an unofficial location for it, isn't it? It's like an awkward location. It's just in this. So we should say something optionally that we're able to pass in a negative true, which probably means we can force an integer as well. I expect. I think that we're just taking this data and passing it right into a RAND call. Um, so, do you want to explore how we would update that in the docs? That'll be fun. You ready? <laughs> just hang out with me all afternoon, huh? Here's the docs right here. Uh, we can check it. I roll over it, and it's telling me it's a 00, zero NFT, zim doc underscore docs, so that's good. We'll do a search in the docs for zim.pick equals. And here's zim pick. If we scroll up, pick.series, pick.rand. Ah, look at that. There it is right there. So static methods is a pick rand. Oh, well, that's got the stuff there. Um, where was it that we wanted to mention the choices? So a range object with min, max, integer, and negative properties. Okay, so that's 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 nicer. There it is under parameters of pick. But where was it that we saw the problem? It was in the formats history of pick. Um, plus integer and negative okay because that would have been misleading we would have seen that and thought that maybe it wasn't there we did have it announced down below here so we saved this up um i want to make sure that we can upload it so i'm gonna go find it in here there it is uh, adam has a, a bug basically that if this folder were closed and i sit on this document and i do my shortcut for uploading even if i say upload like that, it ends up uploading the whole folder. <sighs> Good God. So that uploads all of basically everything that's in the CDN, it uploads. And it was like really annoying. So you have to make sure that like if that weren't, uh, if that weren't um, uploaded, what would happen is it would upload the whole NFT folder rather than uh, It's a really bad bug. I've complained about it, but I don't think they've, so I have to learn now that if I'm doing something, especially this one, that I'm going to right click on that and hit upload and, and, and we're good. That will make sure that that gets uploaded or indeed I can hit my shortcut over here. All right, so that's uploaded, but that's the main docs. Uh, you can see that this stuff is what shows up in the docs, but I actually have to run, here's a browser, a new tab here, this one right here called live, hit live. And that says that it's just updated the docs. Now, if we go back to the docs, and I have to refresh the docs, refresh the docs, hit pick. And we'll take a look down here. Oh, is that the right pick? That was a color picker. His pick, pick choices. Okay, here it is. And there it is, a random range, range object format plus integer and negative shows up in the docs now. Yay! And we wouldn't have had to spend half an hour talking about it and trying to figure out if it worked or not. <laughs> so that's good. That sounds like a pretty good place to end with the Zim Explorer. Isn't that, hasn't that been a fun one? What a great uh, app. You can use this for all sorts of um, things, you know, uh, 
to match up stuff. It's a very common question. That's a nice match. So this has been Dr. Abstract oh, with a Zim Explorer. Uh, if you're still here, of course, come visit us at zimjs.com slash slack or zimjs.com slash discord. We'd love to talk to you and uh, share the word about Zim. Join, uh, follow us, uh, follow Dr. Abstract, Dr. Underscore Abstract on Twitter. Of course, if you go to the Zim site, you can find all the social media down at the bottom. Have a great day or night. I'm going to go eat some din-din. Yeah.